All right. Well, let's turn to Philippians chapter 2, if you haven't picked up on it. Whenever I teach, we're slowly going through the book of Philippians. Hope you're able to crack that code. <clears throat> and as, as I've mentioned before, uh, the book of Philippians is about how to have joy in your life. Not happiness, joy. In chapter 2, in the beginning of chapter 2, we were told to walk humbly and put away selfish ambition and to look out for the interest of others, to be other-centered. And that's a theme that really we see as we look at this passage that we're going to look at. You know, if you take joy, many of you have heard the acronym for joy, Jesus, others, you. It's true. And so we're to look out for the interests of other people. And Paul gives us Jesus as a total example of that mindset. He says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was God, Jesus laid aside the perks of deity and he humbled himself. The one who the angels worshiped and served for all the way back to when he created the angels, made himself of no reputation. You kind of wonder if there were some angels that maybe said, Lord, you really got to go do this? You'd go down and be one of them, a human? And he became a man. He became a man even to the point of being a servant. And Jesus identified with our human condition. And he obeyed God, his father, even to the point of death on a cross. And now... Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2 that he's been ex exalted above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. They're all going to admit that Jesus is Lord, every single one of them. And we do that willingly now on this side of heaven. And when we do, God works in us, and we saw this last week, to do and to will of his good pleasure, because Christianity is an inside job. God puts his nature, his spirit in our hearts, and then what God works in us, Paul told us to work it out. We work out our salvation. It was like we exercise. We work it out. We let it be seen. And so that means that we think through all of the ramifications of our Christianity, his love, his grace, his mercy, his power in our lives. And we saw last time that it turns the church into a non-grumbling and no complaining zone. We're told in verses 12 through 18 to hold fast to his word, to shine as lights in a crooked and perverse world. Uh, we see that ever so uh, boldly now, you know, as we see it on TV and all around us. And then we're willing to pour ourselves out for the sake of each other's faith. And last week we saw that if we want to have joy, we need to realize that God is working in our lives and we need to join him. We need to join him which brings us to our text tonight in verses 19 through 30. And these last, in these last 12 verses, Paul mentions two men, Timothy and Epaphroditus, who really embodied the character of what he's been writing about, the character of what a true servant of Jesus is all about. And both Timothy and Epaphroditus were outstanding servants of the Lord. And Paul loved them very much. This was very personal to him. And not only can we glean a lot from their example, but we can learn a lot from Paul about the, the importance of showing appreciation for God's people, our brothers and sisters. That's why to have joy, let's learn to appreciate each other. Let's learn to appreciate each other. 
we would have so much joy in our lives if we learned to thank and praise God for people and express, uh, express appreciation to them like Paul did. And sadly, what you have in the church, I, other churches, not ours, but you have believers who are just really critical of others. Really cr critical. They, instead of building up people, they tear down. And so Paul sending these two back to Philippi. Timothy was a seasoned pastor. It was kind of his right-hand man. He was a son in the faith. And he's sending them to Philippi to help pastor them and encourage them. Epaphroditus was from Philippi. He had come to minister to Paul in prison in Rome. So picture this. So you have Rome over here. Let me reverse that. You have Rome way over here and Colossians way over here. Oh, this is going to drive me nuts. And so Epaphroditus traveled from Colossians, right? All the way to Rome to minister to Paul's needs. Brought uh, provision for Paul to take care of him. He might have even been the pastor. We'll get into that. But he came to minister, and now Paul's sending both Timothy and Epaphroditus. He's sending Timothy there to minister, and he's sending Epaphroditus back. And then we get to learn all we can glean from this, this passage. So with that in mind, let's read our text. Verse 19 of Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, but your, mess but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick almost unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but, upon, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I sent him the more, uh, the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Re receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Let's pray. Ah, Heavenly Father, I just pray. It's always neat to see people and learn from their character and their example. And Lord, as we start to look into this passage and start to unpack it, Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would start to speak to our hearts and minister to our hearts what we can learn about these two wonderful men and about Paul who loved them so much. And Lord, may it give us an appreciation for those around us. Oh, Lord, grow us and change us and shape us into your image and likeness, Lord, according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right. Well, as we take a look at this, the first thing we're going to look at in verses 19 through 24 is the sending of Timothy. When he focuses, he's talking about Timothy now. And the purpose of sending Timothy, he, Paul has this really strong connection with the believers at Philippi. They were very close to him. They were his friends. Uh, Calvary Chapel Philippi was a great church. I say that tongue in cheek. It was a great church and he loved them dearly. And he simply wanted to send Timothy to check on them to see how they were doing. So he's sending Timothy. Now, I like what he starts off by saying in verse 19, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. The simple act of sending Timothy on a mission, we see Paul's submission to the Lord's will. Paul was trusting. 
goes, trust in the Lord Jesus. Even in the simple little thing, Paul wanted what Jesus wanted. Even in the little things. So often, we, we go to the Lord for his will for the biggies. But sometimes, the little things, we take control of. Sometimes we don't even offer them to the Lord. Lord, what's your will for me in this? And so it's a neat little lesson to learn that Paul, even in this simple little thing, he's trusting the Lord Jesus for this. Now, to understand what's going on here a little bit better, we need to understand first century communications. If we go back into the distant past, the days before Twitter and Facebook, before cell phones, car phones, imagine past the day of rotary phones, cracks me up. You know, my kids, I don't, I don't think they've ever seen a rotary phone. <laughs> Before the telegraph and the telegram. If you even go past that, past the Pony Express, I mean, it's just, you think about it. As you go back, it begins to just kind of blow your mind a little bit because of how much technology has changed and, and improved communication and leaps and bounds. But in the days of Paul, all that innovation was still future. And in the ancient Greco-Roman world, long distance communication was conducted by a messenger. You would have somebody who would travel, usually on foot, carrying with him a message, sometimes in a letter or a scroll. And his arrival was far from a sure thing because it often took months to travel across rugged ter terrain, dangerous seas and oceans, uh, down bandit-ridden paths. And, you know, when a messenger was taking a communication, there was definitely a great danger in doing that. And so it was a big deal for Timothy to travel to Rome, uh, from Rome to Philippi, on behalf of Paul and for Epaphroditus to journey from Philippi to Rome in the name of the Philippians, and now he's going back to Philippi. This is a big deal. Both of these men were making a huge sacrifice. The shortest route between the two cities was to leave Philippi. You walked west on this road called the Via Ignatia. It was a Roman road that stretched 350 miles across Macedonia, and then it ended on the shores of the Adriatic Sea. Then you would hop on a rickety old boat and you would take it 80 miles to Italy. And then once you were there, you had another 350 mile walk to Rome along another famous road called the Via Appia. So that's 700 miles on foot, not including the ocean cruise that they took. So that's like, that's like you wanna walk to Southern California that's going to take you a long time to do. And under good conditions, it could take two to three months. Under challenging conditions, it could take much longer. But my point is that Paul, when he talks about sending these men back and forth, it's a big deal. We read about it like it happened. It just happened. But this was expensive. It was time-consuming. It was hard, and it was dangerous. But remember... People mattered to the Apostle Paul. He mattered to the Apostle. They mattered to the Apostle Paul. In chapter 1, Paul said this of the Philippians, I have you in my heart. How greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. He wanted to find out what their spiritual state was. He was, I want to know your state. I want to know how you're doing and it was worth the sacrifice of the time and risk and labor that went into the travel. And obviously, Timothy and Epaphroditus, they agreed. He wanted to know how things were going. And I wonder really what Paul would think of Christians today. Because so often, we can get so busy that we can't call a friend even with all the different varieties of ways that we have to communicate, just at our fingertips, and how we don't uh, reach out. And when Paul heard of the struggling believers, 
He saved money uh, for weeks to buy an expensive parchment. He wrote a letter uh, waiting for a messenger and who would then travel land and sea, braving the danger to deliver that message. You know, and I just wonder how Paul would think of Christians. I remember hearing a, when I was at Bible college a story that David Hawking, if you don't know him, he's a great Bible teacher, pastor. And he was teaching at the Bible college and he shared when he was on staff at Calvary Costa Mesa, he was teaching and there was a lady, a very well-to-do lady in the church that came up to him and said, have you seen so-and-so? And I think I may have shared this with you. And he said, no, I haven't. He goes, yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen her in over a week. He said, well, why don't you look, into, look, look in on her? And so she did. And when she went to her house and went in, come to find out she'd had a stroke and was laying on the, on the floor in all of her mess for three days. And no one had checked on her. And this lady immediately, obviously, got her medical attention. And she started, she was, thankfully was making a good recovery. And this lady so sweetly just took it upon herself to go back to the house and scrub it from ceiling to floor to get it ready for her. And the idea that had this woman not had the compassion to go, where is so-and-so? She probably would have died and just laid on that ground until she passed away. You know, here's the thing, brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you. If the Lord puts someone across your path, that's not chance. If the Lord brings someone into your life and they're struggling and they're hurting, don't go, oh, Pastor Josh will do it. Pastor Zach, we'll get him. Pastor Nathaniel, he's a youth pastor. He'll do anything. You know what I mean? It's like, no, the Lord showed you that. But I don't have time. Oh, make time. Maybe watch a little less TV. I'm making that up. But the truth of the matter is that if someone is put in your path and you think, man, maybe I need to reach out to this person. Maybe I need to minister to this person. How important it is that you heed that because that may be the Lord. So don't neglect that. So now, back to this, think about Paul. The, the wait to find out how they were doing, three months three to four months. Imagine, you send them, you don't know if they got there. It's going to be three to four months to find out if they got there, how things are going, they come back. I mean, we really have it good. It's like, how are you doing? How can I pray for you? <laughs> it's like instant. So it, it actually would be, no, it would be, it would be six months, six months before you get the answer. Just just anxiously waiting for that correspondence to come back. And I'm sure it felt like years. And in our age of instant feedback, it's really difficult for us to imagine what that's like. Have you ever, I know you have, have you ever texted somebody and they don't get right back to you? And it's like, they don't get back to you that day, maybe the next day maybe the day after, and you think, how rude <laughs> that you're not instantly, see how we've all been conditioned now? It's like, oh, I texted you. So I expect to see that little wave of dots going like this, that you're writing and texting me back immediately. For me, I'm getting used to it. Because my little, my little five-year-old autistic son comes and steals my wife's phone, and I'll call her, and then he'll answer, and I just hear breathing. <laughs> and so I know she doesn't have her phone, so she'll get back to me when she does. But you know how it is. Imagine 
what it's like if you couldn't get an answer for six months. Most people get their tax refund back sooner than that. So Paul would have to be very patient. And I'll tell you right now, if you can see the church today, I don't know how much patience he'd have with the excuses of Christians. And I'm talking about other churches, but of Christians not caring about or communicating with one another. You know, listen, the truth of the matter was he'd be appalled if a brother or sister slipped through the cracks at a Calvary chapel because no one reached out to him or her. You know, listen, God's people aren't just about work, stuff, and entertainment. We invest in the lives of people. We're to seek meaningful relationships with one another. And it's hard to relate with a brother or sister if you don't communicate. Remember Jesus said this, all men will know you are my disciples by how often you go to church. Oh no. All men will know you are my disciples by how much you give in the offering. No. Nope. All men will know you are my disciples by how loud you sing. Nope. All men will know you are my disciples by the love you have for one another. And that's more than us just saying hi. God bless you at church. Giving someone a hug. That's all good, but it means investing in somebody else in need. Encouraging them, praying for them, listening to them, helping them. Remember, John wrote this. In 1 John, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So biggie, here's a biggie. He laid down his life for us. There's no greater love. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And then he gives, he goes to this extreme and then he, he just totally dials it back. He says, but whoever has this world's goods and see his, sees his brother in need, we're talking about within the church now, sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue. Hi, God bless you, but in deed and in truth. In other words, if you have material goods, and you see someone who's legitimately in need, and you go, oh, the church will get it. Oh, Pastor Josh will get it. Somebody else will get it. The Lord, John's like, how's the love of the Lord in you? Something's wrong. Something's really wrong. How much more than, we're not even talking about material goods. We're dialing it back. How about just seeing how they're doing? How about a listening ear? Some compassion, you know what I mean? And so that's, where we're, that, that's why we're studying this. This is why Paul's sending Timothy and, to Philippi. Even though he was hundreds of miles away and he's suffering in prison at this time, he's still concerned about them. He's not like, oh, my life stinks. I'm just focused on me. You know, and he's not in one of our prisons where you get three squares a day and if you are respectful, you're usually treated with respect. No, it's not, it's in a, it's in a, it's a first century prison. But here you see a shepherd's heart. It goes back to verse four. Don't look out only for your own interests, your personal interests, but the interests of others. Paul really practiced what he preached. And so he wanted to send Timothy to encourage them that he would be encouraged. He wanted to encourage them and he wanted to be encouraged because it brought him joy to know that the Philippian church was doing well. And that's the purpose of sending Timothy. But then we see the pattern of life Timothy demonstrated in verses 20 and 21. And here we get some insights as to the kind of person Timothy was. And we do not have time to do a deep dive into Timothy because he's, he's a lot in the scriptures. But Paul shows us the importance of 
showing and sharing appreciation of others. And we see, number one, his companionship to Paul. Look at verse 20. For I have no one like-minded. No one like-minded. So as far as Paul knew, there was no one who felt shepherd, shepherd's heart pastorally the same way for these believers except for Timothy. Their souls were equal in this way. And that's what like-minded means, that the souls were equal. What a beautiful description of friendship. It reminds me of David and Jonathan in the Old Testament, whose souls were so knit together in friendship that they had this incredible godly love for one another. So much so that if you guys remember the story, Jonathan was willing to not be the king because of what he knew his best friend was anointed to be king. So instead of exerting his rights as the king's son, the prince, he was like, no, you're, you're the king. You're going to be the king. Ah, just a beautiful friendship. And here Paul, he's much older and more experienced than Timothy. He was like a spiritual father. And now the spiritual child is reflecting the concern of the spiritual father, like father, like son. It's pretty cool. And when you don't have people with that heart, that like-minded heart, it's like pulling teeth. Uh, as a pastor, I've heard of pastors who hated where they ministered. They just didn't even like the people. I remember one pastor, just tell you the story, I won't mention his name, he's a Calvary guy. He had a, he had a good, decent-sized church back east, and the Lord put it on his heart to go up north uh, in the uh, Vermont area to start another church. So he handed his church off, very successful church, uh, lots of people, uh, three, 400 people. He handed it off to an assistant pastor to take over, and he went up to where God had called him. And then he added this little thing when he was sharing this with, story with us. He added that when he was a pastor, he goes, you know, I had all my staff get there like at 9 o'clock in the morning, you know, for the day. And I'd roll in around 10, 11, 12, you know, and get in there and do that. And I just kind of went, oh, okay. He just shared that. So then he goes up there and he says, here I am. Uh, we put all our money that we had in deposit into this house that we were renting, and it was awful. It was just, just filled with cockroaches. It was dirty. We couldn't get our deposit back. My wife was crying all the time. So then I go to then I go to a pastor uh, at this local area, it's the church, and there's like 15 people coming. And his words, he says, I hated every single one of them. He goes, I'm sitting there and I go and I teach, and all they wanted to do is argue over the sermon. It's all they wanted to do. There was no one like-minded for him. And he was just so bummed and discouraged and he was seeking the Lord. And you know what the Lord told him? This is what he said. The Lord told him. Oh, and he also shared this, that when he went up there, he didn't have a salary, so he had to go and get two jobs. And he remembered that he was at work five minutes early and the Lord spoke to his heart and he said, you know, when you were working with me down at the church, he said, I paid you much better and you were never on time. And he was like, is that what this whole thing's about? Because he just got sloppy as a pastor. But no like-mindedness, it was, it was brutal. But yet it's such an incredible blessing for a pastor when he sees the church body being like-minded. Like-minded with him, like-minded with each other, like-minded with the Lord. When you just see people loving on one another and ministering to one another. John said, I have no great, this is the truth. I, I, I felt this as a youth pastor and I felt this as a senior pastor. He said, no greater joy than to see that my children walk in the truth. When you see the people that you minister to making godly biblical decisions, 
They seek out wise counsel. They apply God's word to the issues of their life. They make godly decisions. You let, they let the Lord just, just meddle in all of their lives and, and work and move. Go away. It's like, it's, it's just, there's no greater joy. It's so beautiful. And so just this wonderful companionship to Paul. But then you see his concern for others in verse 20. He goes, no one's like-minded who will sincerely care for your state, who really care for you guys. Now, what this is saying, there was nothing false about Timothy. You could count on him to be real. And our society just is constantly teaching us to be phony and hypocritical, to put up a good front. Uh, it's a good thing we don't see that in politicians, right? I mean, maybe recently we may have seen some of this where they put up a good front but it's completely two-faced. No, nah, maybe no, no. You know, it's like, listen, Timothy had a sincere interest in the things concerning these Philippian Christians. And the word care is an interesting word because it's usually used in a bad sense. It means to divide. And it means to be anxious, an anxious care or be distracted. Do you guys remember the story of Mary and Martha and... Mary, uh, Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet and Martha was like telling Jesus, tell her to help me. When you read that passage, remember, it says Mary and Martha were serving together. Then at some point in that, that event, she went and sat at his feet. Well, she got irritated. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are worried, distracted, same word, and bothered about so many things but she's chosen the right thing. Now, the context here, the word is used in a good way, speaking about Timothy's concern for the Philippians. So the idea here is to be distracted off of yourself and onto the need of others. You know, they say humility is not thinking less of yourself or uh, thinking of yourself uh, less, less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less and less. You know, you're like you're some worm. That's not what it's talking about. What it is, is that your heart and mind are on the interests and needs of others. And you're distracted off yourself. And there's something about, seriously, I'm just tell you something. There is something about discouragement and depression. As a Christian, when it settles in and it hits every single one of us, it does. It gets us, you know? And, you know, for me, uh, it was just, you know, I was working, I was full-time assistant pastor up in Grass Valley. My knee went bad. I had to resign. And then for years, just kind of floating around, being able to work from home to make a little bit. But, but I was so discouraged because I couldn't walk. And it was like I was just missing out on my family growing up, the kids not being able to do much. And... You know, it's like I always told people, never, ever take walking for granted. And anybody who has something that's gone wrong, whether it's a back, a hip, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. It's like don't take, you know, uh, our brother Pat who broke his wrist and it's all messed up. They never take grabbing something for granted, you know. But the point of it is that one of the keys when you're discouraged, even depressed, is you start to give your life away. When you start to get your eyes off of you and your problems, and you start to minister to other people and their lives, you will find that the Lord will fill your heart with joy because you're others-centered. Oh, I have seen this to be true so many times in my life. So may we really grow in this because it's very hard in our culture. We're very busy it, and it's, it's very, we're very fractured and it's very easy for us to just be focused on our own lives. So then we also see in contrast to others, verse 21, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. In other words, their favorite subject is themselves. Have you ever seen anybody who fits that description? Sometimes I look in the mirror and I see them. Yeah, 
<laughs> Amen. You look in the mirror and you're like, hey, knucklehead. You know, you know my wife, she doesn't even need to nag me about it. I can just see it in her face. You know, I'll be doing my thing and I'll just see it and I'm going, I'm being really selfish today. You know, I'm my favorite subject. Now, listen, this happens to all of us. In a recent study I read about, 60% of all of our communication centers around ourselves. And on social media, the percentage rises to a whopping 80%. Me, myself, and I. We are part of the selfie generation. Do you remember back in the days, us old people, when... People would go to take a picture and they're like, no, 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 don't take my picture. I don't, want to, I don't want to be in a picture. I don't want to, they didn't like the way they looked or whatever. It's like, no big deal. And nowadays it's <laughs> duck lips. You know, seriously, it's, it's interesting. I, you'll see someone and you look at their Facebook and you're like, oh, look, they literally have, not exaggerating, over 50 pictures of the same pose every day you know, or whatever. And it's just like, I mean, oh, you know what? We actually have these little sticks now that we get the camera to even get a better shot of ourselves. It's called a selfie stick. <laughs> self, self, self. Listen. We have Paul here. He's not only talking about people being this way, church folk, He's also talking about spiritual leaders. Because when he says no one has this except no one has this desire for their care, he's talking about leadership. This is a temptation for all of us, all of us individually, even pastors. Because I'll tell you, as pastors, you know, let's just keep it very real. I've got my Christianese down pretty good, you know? I've been teaching the Bible for 30 years. And I know how to, and I, I can be as two-faced with the best of them. And you wouldn't know a thing. Yeah, at some point it'd come out. But the truth is, we're all tempted with this stuff. I remember, I read, a, I read about, you guys remember the, the cruise ship, the Costa Concordia off the, the shore of Tuscany, when that thing hit a rock and it yeah. fell over and started to sink. And there were 4,000 passengers on board. 32 passengers drowned. You know what they say happened? The captain was on the bridge without his glasses, showing off for, to a woman passenger that he had brought on board as a romantic interest. So he's showing off with her and then they hit, ship hit, and it rolls over and begins to sink. And what happens? He's one of the first to abandon ship. Instead of making sure the evacuation went well, he was actually told to get back on the ship, and he didn't. Listen, 30, 32, sad, 32 people drowned. And this captain who you would have thought would put everyone before himself, you know, go down with the ship and all that, so to speak. He was all about himself and impressing himself, and it cost lives. And Timothy was the very opposite in that he wasn't self-centered. Uh, Timothy was no show-off. There was nothing selfie about Timothy. A huge contrast. And this is normal in this world to be self-centered. This is totally normal. But sadly, it's normal amongst Christians too. And this goes all the way back to, to the church age. Do you remember Corinth? Remember all of the little divisions at Corinth that Paul had to address? These people talked about all the gifts that they had. They were rocking and rolling, people speaking in tongues and you know, people, there's churches that so focus on the gifts and they were so focused. And he goes, you are carnal. You're like babies. You're fighting amongst each other. 
You're trying to one up, do, it's like somebody would prophesy and do, uh, do this, and they would just kind of one up each other constantly. Who's more spiritual? None of you. Listen, there have been Corinths throughout the centuries. And we wonder why people have so little joy sometimes. Because we're so, we could get so selfie oriented when joy really comes from giving of yourself to other people. And the more selfish we are, the less we experience real joy. Then Paul says, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. So we're not even talking about self-centered, we're talking about being Christ-centered. And in this verse here, the context is being interested in others and it's linked with verse 21. They seek their own, not the things which are of Christ. It's linked with the things of Christ. Listen, to be interested in others, my brothers and sisters, is to show true service to Jesus. I want to serve the Lord. People say that, I want to serve the Lord. How can I serve the Lord? And they're looking for ways to serve the Lord. Hey, if you become other-centered, if you just take an interest in believers at church, you may never be an usher. You may never sing. You may never teach. You may never be in... But if you just take an interest in others, that is serving the Lord. Because Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And then remember, Paul wrote in chap this chapter, verse four, let this mind be in you, the servant's heart that was in Christ Jesus. So that when we're serving one another, we are also serving the Lord. And Timothy had the selfless characteristic in his life. And then we see that's the pattern of life, of, of life Timothy demonstrated, but then we see the proof of his character in verse 22. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Paul reminds these believers that they knew about Timothy from Paul's first visit there to Philippi. Because Paul went to Philippi in Acts chapter 16, guess who he picked up? Timothy. So Paul says, you guys know his proven character. You remember Timothy. He says, you know you know this about him. And the word know means continually. You continually saw this in his life. It was very consistent. You know, I heard it said, the church today has plenty of characters. What we need, though, is more character. It's true. He was consistent. May we also be consistent in the church. May our reputations be not a facade, but proven godly character. And so this is really rare because everyone in our culture is just out for themselves. It's very rare to be like Timothy, to be others centered in this world. And Paul mentions the type of relationship that he had with him, that he goes, as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. The word with means close companionship and served means serving as a slave. Timothy, his heart was of a bondservant, a slave. Remember Jesus said, if you want to be great in the kingdom, give a lot of money. If you want to be great in the kingdom, have the best church. You know, I'm going to keep doing this until you guys zero in on it. You know what I'm talking about. He said, if you want to be great in the kingdom, be a servant. He who is greatest in the kingdom is servant of all. The mark of a servant is how you act when you're treated like one. You know, you're serving the Lord and you're, you're doing it. And then someone comes up and just kind of blows you off. Hey, could you go do this? And you're like, oh, there's that temptation to go, oh, how dare they? Why didn't they thank me for this? That kind of shows you where your heart's at because you were doing it to be seen by men. And the Bible says, don't let your service be so that Pastor Josh sees you serving. Pastor Mike sees you in the children's ministry, loving on those kids. Don't do it for that reason. You do it as unto the Lord. That's important. Because that means if, so, if someone, if you're a servant, 
that means that when it comes to the, to the day of giving out uh, reward, we're going to see the servants who never made it in front of a pulpit, way up in front, us pastors, way in the back going, I knew it. I knew this would happen. A slave is someone who is obedient to his master. And Timothy had a submissive heart and life. And he served him like a child to his father. But it wasn't just submission. He served Paul out of love. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 1, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, to Timothy, my beloved son. Very, very close. Must have been hard to send him to Philippi. It's one thing to serve with submission, but there could be a lot of motivations with that, right? Parents, you tell your kids, go clean your room. You tell them to take out the trash. You tell them to say you're sorry. What do you get? You get the rolling of the eyes. I'm sorry. The, the most insincere apology of all time. You know, all right, I'll go do that. You know, they just drag. It's just like, oh my gosh. You're like you're torturing them when you ask them to do things and to help in the family and submit. Just my family? No, I'm kidding. Uh, but no, seriously, we all know how that is. And we don't want to serve the Lord from that attitude. The attitude of, all right, Pastor Todd said I got to serve. I guess I got to reach out to other people. Wrong attitude. You do it out of love to Jesus first and out of love to others around you. And if you're like, I don't have that, then go to the Lord for it. Go, Lord, give me a love for everyone around me that doesn't go away. You know, when I was at Bible college, I shared this before. I had a guy came to me. He, he just, this guy was, first we got along pretty well. We both played football. <laughs> I made it to college. He made it to pro. So he, he was a tight end in the NFL, and he's there. But as time went on, he became quite the jerk. And, uh, and by he would admit that. And to the point where he just rubbed everybody the wrong way. The dean wanted to boot him out of the school. One of the assistant pastors said, let me disciple him one-on-one, -on -one, basically to try to save, save his education up there and, and everything. And I remember that I, I, he was, we were in the same dorm and house, and he was giving me an attitude. And I got so fleshy, and I went, Lord, I don't care if he's dying I don't want to have anything to do with that guy. And I didn't get 10 seconds with that attitude before the Holy Spirit was on top of me. <clears throat> and the Lord really showed me that I brought him into your life so that you could learn to just love the unlovable. No matter how he reacts to you, I want you to love him. I don't care what he does. My whole attitude changed. Because now I just looked at him as like, you know what? I'm going to love him like Jesus loves him. And I don't care what I get in response. I'd walk by him. You know, you walk by, you're like, hey, what's up? You go like this. He literally take my hand and throw it away, like a physical gesture. You're like, you know, you know, you're around the dudes. That's quite offensive. You know what I mean? To be physical like that. It's like, really? Really? And I just went, eh, it's okay. I don't care what he does. I'm just going to keep loving him. And I just did that through the whole semester. So then fast forward, we get to the end of the semester. We're all about to graduate. He gets up and says, I want to address the, the, camp, the whole student body. And he just apologized to everybody and asked for forgiveness. And it was really heartfelt, tearful. And then he says, you know, there's two guys that wouldn't stop loving me no matter how much I try to push them away. And he mentioned me and another guy. My jaw fell on the ground because I really had written off that this guy would ever respond to any of this. And at the end no matter how mean he was to me, he, it broke through. I couldn't believe it. And the Lord was like, and that's why I brought him into your life. You will have people in your life that don't deserve your love, that rub you the wrong way. They might even be people in this church. They might be people, your family members. You love them like Jesus loves them. Amen? That was Timothy. And so, 
just, may we serve and submit to the Lord and love one another. Then we see the prospect of his coming in verse 23. He says, therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes. And it's just kind of cool here that because of his character, Paul wants, he's ready to use him in a powerful way. But Paul still wants what the Lord wants. He says, as soon as I see how it goes for me. He goes, but I trust in the Lord that I myself shall have shall also come shortly. You know, it's kind of cool. Here he is in prison, and he's waiting on a decision from, I believe it's Nero, and how things are going to go for him. Do I live? Do I die? I think I'll be able to come to you guys. I'm pretty confident. But it's like, it's up to the Lord ultimately. It's like the perfect balance here, a combination of faith and then a carefulness to not go into presumption. Like, I know I'm getting out of here. How many people have said, I know, I mean, I've seen this many, many times. I've seen, peop- I've seen pastors say, I know God's going to heal this person. God's going to heal this person. And then the person didn't get healed and died. And I, I, have, a, I have a hard time with that. When, you know, when I pray for people, I say, Lord, if it's your will, you can heal them. And I don't know what your will is, so and you'll hear me pray like that. So I pray that you, I do pray for the healing, but your will be done. I don't go up and promise the person, oh, you know what? Yeah, you know what? Your God's shown me. If God, you say, if you say God showed you, that they better be healed or we're going to take you out and stone you according to the Old Testament. No, I'm kidding. But listen, the idea here is to just trust the Lord. He, Paul's heart to just whatever the Lord has. James Four tells us this, come now you who say today and tomorrow we will go into such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. You know, the right attitude is, Lord, if you will, we'll be going on vacation as a family. Lord, if it's your will, I'm going to get that job. Lord, if it's your will, I'll be, you know, such and such and such. The idea is trusting the Lord with your life. Now let's get to the sacrifice of Epaphroditus, and I need to speed this up to wrap up, so not to be a diss on Epaphroditus. But here we have Paul's second example of showing appreciation for a brother. And Epaphroditus, it says here, was your messenger. He came, uh, brought provisions to minister to the Apostle Paul. And some say he could have been the pastor of the church in Philippi. Now, the necessity of sending him to them in verse 25, the reason he did it, look at here in verse 25, yet I consider it necessary to send uh, Epaphroditus, he says, your messenger, the one whom you ministered, the reason, the necessity of sending him back was because he knew in verse 26 that they were distressed. They were distressed. Epaphroditus had become sick, really sick, almost died. And Paul Paul says that God showed him mercy. And Paul would have been devastated if he had died. And And he got healed. And so, but the church at Philippi didn't know how Epaphroditus was doing. So he just thought it's wisest, let me just send him back to you because they were so tied together, Paul and Epaphroditus and Timothy and them, that it's like he just wanted to encourage them. Paul, again, I just want to encourage them. So he's willing to give up someone who's helping him to help them. Such a sweetness. And they were probably losing their joy over this. And look at his description of him. He says here, Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier. Paul just saw him as a fellow servant, just his brother. It was a sweet, sweet bond. And notice it wasn't, I'm higher than Epaphroditus. We're all equal. Do you guys realize that? The pastor, don't pedestal a pastor. Don't put Josh up on a pedestal. We're all the same before the Lord. We're all servants. Put the cookies on the bottom shelf where we all get them. That's where we're all at, right? 
Because listen, all he is is a different part of the body. There's all these different members of the body. Some are toes, some are feet, some are hands, some are mouths, some are ears, some are brains. You know, the ones that are, maybe I call those the administrator guys, you know. But it's important that we understand this. And there was, it says here, um, fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my needs since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick unto death, but God had mercy on him. It's so interesting. I think this is so neat that Epaphroditus was willing to give his life. He's willing to undertake this journey to go and minister to Paul no matter what happened to him. You know, and just, it's interesting. You know, Paul wrote to Timothy in Timothy chapter two, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier. Timothy did. You know, Epaphroditus was a fellow soldier, just like Timothy was. And that tells us that Christianity is not a bed of roses. There are battles to be fought. There is warfare that we deal with and conflicts to overcome. And so, you know, there's a neat balance that we see here. Often there's, sometimes in a church, you'll have people emphasize fellowship uh, so much that they forget the furthering of the gospel. Some churches don't see beyond their four walls. And then some are so into defending the faith of the gospel that they neglect the fellowship with other believers. Uh, There's plenty of evangelism going on, but there's no building up of the body of Christ. Epaphroditus did not fall into either of these traps. Um, There are those who serve, but they don't like fellowship with other Christians. They don't like to be taught. They like to teach. Epaphroditus was a balanced Christian. And in verse 25 again, he says, when he says you're a messenger, that word is apostle. He was uh, their apostle to him to minister to his need. And So, and I've already mentioned verse 26, that he was longing to go back and tell him, guys, I'm fine, I'm fine. The Lord took care of me. Um, I do want to point out this. Don't ever listen to people who teach you that God does not allow a Christian who has faith to get sick. That word faith garbage. I've known people that, I have served with people. Oh, man. I have served with people in Calvary Chapel that they left and then they bought into that stuff. That Christians aren't supposed to be sick. They're supposed to be healthy and wealthy and all of that stuff. And right here, Epaphroditus was allowed to get sick. He almost died. God healed him. This idea that that a Christian doesn't get sick uh, is ridiculous. One time I was talking to somebody and they go, yeah, I believe that. I go, really? Then why does anybody die? No answer. We're supposed to be healthy and wealthy perpetually. Then none of us should ever die. Didn't have an answer. And so it's very important. But it's neat that, you know, um, in facing his own death, Epaphroditus was concerned about the Philippian Christians. So therefore, verse 28, I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. So it's just, it's so neat to see that. You know, God can heal. He can do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think. Uh, I've prayed, listen, I'm gonna, again, be honest. I prayed for people and they got healed. I prayed for people and then later they died. (laughs) Be careful if you ask me to pray for you. But I, I say that jokingly. But I remember one time this, this guy came up and said, we have an uncle that's going through this stuff. And he came up and I just happened to be the one up here to pray for him. So I prayed for him. A week later, I saw him and I go, hey, so what happened to your uncle? Oh, I forgot to tell you, he was totally healed. Really cool, praise the Lord. So a week later, they come, they go, they came up and they, they're standing in line waiting for me. And I'm praying with somebody else. And then they come up and I go, 
there's other people? And he goes, well, yeah, but, you know, we want to come to you because, you know, our uncle just got healed. We have another prayer request. I'm like, don't do that. Don't do that like I have the red hotline to the Lord. Healing is all up to the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 So then the need of receiving him properly in verse 29. He says, receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem. And here we see it. It's so neat. Receiving brothers and sisters in the Lord and then it says esteem them. Listen, he wanted, to, he wanted them to be welcomed home, but he also wanted them to be honored. The Bible teaches this. Romans says, honor to whom honor is due. Too often, we don't show appreciation towards our fellow believers like we should. As a result, we don't necessarily have the joy that we need to have. You know, I, listen, I'm not thinking of anybody here, but do you ever thank the workers in the children's ministry, take care of your kids and your grandkids? Yada. It's like, if I didn't, if it wouldn't creep the, if it wouldn't creep Mike out, I'd kiss him every Sunday for taking care of my kids. <laughs> but he'd, he'd wig him out, he'd probably punch me. <laughs> but if I said it was a holy kiss, maybe he'd let me do it on the cheek. But anyways, but the thing is this, listen, we need to show our appreciation to each other. Guys, listen, the Bible says, let your praise come from another man. You're never supposed to toot your own horn. Look at me, look what I did. Let me tell you what I did today. The Bible says, let your praise come from another man. But what that means is this, the Lord uses us to build up and edify one another, and the Lord uses you to go to someone and that blessed you or you saw or whatever, and you put your hand on their shoulder and you go, thank you, I appreciate what you did. God bless you, what a blessing. That's the Lord using you to edify other people. Sometimes you and I could be his hands, his feet, and his encouragement to others. How cool is that? So make sure that you do that because that's what he was telling the, the Philippians when they saw him. You guys, listen. The most important thing we see here in the lives of Timothy and Epaphroditus is that there's a lot in their lives to imitate. But we also learn from the Apostle Paul by showing appreciation to what God is doing in other people. And if you take joy in appreciating others, your joy will grow. And so let us be a church that's encouraging one another, not discouraging, edifying, building up, and letting people know how much of a blessing they are. And maybe there's people that don't have that connection. If God puts them across your path, you be open to ministering to them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time in your word. And I pray right now for every one of my brothers and sisters here tonight. And I ask that you would shape us and mold us into your image, that we would be like you, that we would be imitators of the Apostle Paul, of Timothy and Epaphroditus. Lord, that we would be ambassadors for you. How cool is it when someone is around us and they feel like they're in the presence of Jesus because of the encouragement and joy we put into their lives. Lord, May we learn to appreciate everyone around us. And boy, that starts with our husbands and wives, our kids, our grandparents, our grandkids. Lord, that we be encouraged just by each other as a church. And Lord, as the needs arise, may we all be sensitive to each other, to meeting those needs according to your will and ministering to others. Lord, that we would be a church like Philippi with such a love for you and for one another. Again, thank you for this time in Jesus' name, amen.